Thank you, Kathy, and good afternoon here on uh, December 13th. Who would have thought we'll nearly be at the end of 2022? Um, but yes, we find ourselves here. And I'm looking outside in Midtown Manhattan. It is sunny here, definitely feeling increasingly like the holidays around the city with um, Christmas tree stands and other holiday um, activity around and uh, a sense of uh, some more uh, tourists on the street. And so uh, the city is really starting to you know, move into that holiday mode. Uh, as I'm here today though, uh, as your guide, let me walk you through what we'll cover today. Plenty going on uh, across a number of different disciplines. And if Kathy, you'd go to the next slide, please, I will gladly walk the group through. Thank you. And so our agenda for today will have me covering um, chiefly issues around public health as well as around uh, legislation and newly signed statutes um, with the New York State focus. There's a lot going on, particularly in the space around bill signings, uh, which I will catch all of you up on. Then we'll be joined by Mark Bello Borodov, who is new to Bond, an intellectual property attorney uh, who joined us earlier this year, and this is his first presentation on the program, and he'll be discussing the variety of intellectual property issues before our Supreme Court. Looks to be a really interesting presentation, and I'm sure you'll all be delighted to meet Mark. Stephanie Fedorka is back with us, and she's going to provide updates on um, two uh, labor law matters uh, concerning um, breaks to express breast milk and then retaliatory workplace safeguards for protected leave. So Steph, we're glad that you're back and can walk us through all of that. Kat Grazios um, out of our Albany office is going to be focusing on higher education uh, student discipline cases. And then I will come on back to answer those questions that you may have. So please do uh, stick around. And let me begin with uh, my presentation remarks. So as I mentioned, bill signings are very much picking up. And uh, what you have on the right side of your screen is an example of just one uh, that was recently delivered to the governor. Um, and it's important to understand and be reminded what delivery means means that Governor Hochul has 10 days, not including Sundays, um, to approve, which is to sign, or to reject, which is to veto bills um, passed by both um, houses of the state legislature. Um, <clears throat> and those bills that are signed become law, those that are vetoed don't. Um, however, if nothing happens as far as the governor is concerned um, within that 10 day period, the bill automatically becomes law. And we're looking at these last few weeks of the calendar year as a time when the governor is making decisions around a number of different um, types of uh, you know, pieces of policy that are before her for consideration. The first um, on wage transparency, you'll be hearing more about that next week, um, whether it's signed or not. You've had the chance to um, hear from a number of my colleagues about various regional um, approaches to this. This is a statewide approach. And so the next presentation on this um, will be about whether there is or is not a statewide um, standard ultimately uh, signed into law. Um, we're also looking at uh, you know, some of the other items that the governor has before her, including <coughs> excuse me, co-payments um, around opioid treatment and questions uh, for her to decide on uh, concerning, you know, the reach of liquor licenses at off-premises catering establishments, as of course all of you are familiar during the pandemic, a lot changed in that regard, and um, this is part of that ongoing arc. Um, there are some more technical matters around powers of attorney, but that matter a lot. Um, and then one of the last bills that Assemblymember Gottfried uh, put forward, as all of you are familiar, I presented um, about uh, Assemblymember Gottfried previously, um, after a more than 50 year career uh, within the assembly, uh, Mr. Gottfried is stepping away from the assembly and uh, his leadership on uh, the, of the health committee within the assembly. And so um, this bill around not-for-profit hospices um, is still awaiting the governor's consideration. Next slide, please. 
We also know that actual bill signings are picking up um, considerably. Um, just in the overnight, um, the second on that list, uh, 8869, um, was signed into law. And uh, we also know that recently there was one sign concerning nursing homes um, around being uh, public or otherwise disclosing of uh, presence of an infection um, within a nursing facility and uh, other efforts to uh, make sure that proper infection prevention and control steps are taken. This is one of the other you know, pieces of legislation that clearly connects to the pandemic. Um, and the governor did sign it into law. If you go to the next slide, please. Let's talk about vetoes, of which there have been a few. Uh, last time I spoke about uh, how many that had budgetary uh, aspects in the governor's view, commissions and other bodies um, were generally not getting the governor's uh, approval. And on the list, uh, one that's worth noting, another Gottfried bill, it was one supported by um, various constituencies to essentially create what would be functional due process rights um, under uh, essentially reviews of the inspector general. Uh, the governor uh, did not approve that in a veto message focusing on the fact that uh, essentially it would get in the way in her view of the OMIG's ability to do its job. Um, the Rivera bill that's just below that, 5956, um, that was vetoed um, for the notion that essentially it was uh, administratively redundant, um, although and ultimately confusing in the governor's view uh, to allow physicians assistants to serve as primary care practitioners um, in the Medicaid managed care plan setting. Um, but the governor did direct that um, PAs have information uh, essentially populated within directories as a means of making it better known who they are, um, which she thought was a compromise. And that's again in the veto message uh, and otherwise the relating reporting that we've seen. Next slide, please. So the governor also has um, on her plate some important decisions that are not legislative, but nonetheless within her ambit uh, and one arguably no more important than choosing the next chief judge to the New York State Court of Appeals. Um, former Chief Judge Janet G. Fiore stepped down earlier this year and Governor Hochul has until December 23rd, just around the corner, to uh, name the new chief judge. Uh, Janet DeFiore was uh, the chief judge for uh, the better part of six years, named by former Governor Andrew Cuomo. And this is a consequential pick um, for sure that we'll be tracking on all of your behalf. And if you go to the next slide, please, we'll now move into public health updates and the next one thereafter. Speaking of changes in personnel, um, we're wanting to just make sure all of you uh, heard that the commissioner of New York State uh, Department of Health will be stepping down. That's um, Dr. Mary Bassett. And she has served for um, about a year, um, a little bit more than that, uh, joining the department um, in an acting capacity when former Commissioner Zucker stepped down and she'll be returning to her uh, professorial role at Harvard starting in 23. It is likely based on the pace of the confirmation processes that there will not be um, a new health commissioner right away. Um, the Public Health and Health Planning Council um, spoke about uh, Dr. Bassett, as Dr. Bassett gave her final report to FIPIC uh, late last week, and you know, there was much praise extended for her leadership, um, however truncated it has been. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, please? Um, other public health matters that we're tracking on your behalf. Um, masking, we know, is uh, being talked about increasingly again. We're in this complex stew of viruses that are stirring about, um, including um, RSV and COVID, let alone um, flu A and flu B, which I've mentioned before. And the New York Times just recently reported about, you know, some of the numbers that we're seeing on COVID in just the uh, last two weeks. Um, there's been an increase in New York City of about 55% in terms of diagnoses, um, the hospitalization rates going up. Um, and so with all of that happening, uh, the <clears throat> commissioner of DOHMH, as it's called, um, 
recommended strongly that masks uh, be utilized both in uh, indoor settings as well as crowded outdoor settings. But there are no mandates at the moment. And we'll be tracking this because there may well be ripples across the state, um, but there are no mandates in any jurisdiction at the moment. Next slide, please. Uh, bivalent boosters have been approved for uh, the youngest of uh, kids for whom they're uh, you know, deemed now appropriate. This is you know, through the emergency basis uh, with the FDA. Um, kids uh, six months and older can now get those boosters um, in the context of that stew I mentioned before. Um, next slide, please. And uh, a couple other notes uh, as far as polio is concerned. Uh, we had reported to you previously that there has been um, a focus from public health emergency vantage point on getting uh, a recurrence in polio back under control and the relating um, executive order uh, essentially allowing for emergency powers to do that was allowed to expire. Governor Hochul chose not to renew it. So thankfully, polio is um, in relative remission in terms of um, places where it had been seen and wastewater and the like. Next slide. And then finally, I'll update you with information around um, a change that the Department of Health put out um, very late last month, um, but we haven't had a chance to brief all of you on, which relates specifically to healthcare workers and when they can return to work. And uh, as you can see on the uh, letter as uh, depicted on the right side, it's a wide array of healthcare settings uh, for which this applies. It comes in the context of um, the continuing staffing challenges that we're seeing, not just in New York State, but across the country. And essentially, New York State has come into alignment with CDC guidance that was issued uh, in September, um, giving more flexibilities for asymptomatic individuals. And with that, um, I am done with what I was hoping to cover. And let me introduce you to Mark. Mark um, Beloborodov is a uh, very uh, talented intellectual property attorney who has spent um, the significant amount of his career in private practice, but made the choice recently to come to Bond. Bond was the firm with which he worked very closely um, during his most uh, recently preceding professional stint. And um, it was Bond's culture of commitment and uh, teamwork that really, uh, as Mark relayed to me, um, led him to make the choice to join Bond and serve Bond clients. Um, with that same spirit. And further, Mark has, uh, while not uh, previously appeared on this program, has uh, been involved in similar briefings uh, in settings, including uh, with his last, uh, in his last role, excuse me, and was very excited to join us all. Mark, with his knowledge of intellectual property, um, thought it would be uh, useful to walk through some of the interesting cases that are before the Supreme Court right now. And I'm looking forward to learning. Mark, thank you for joining us. Really delighted that um, you are with us and looking forward to hearing what you have to share. The floor is yours. Excellent. Uh, thank you for this introduction. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the chance to share this interesting developments in the test property law. I'm going to talk about federal law, um, kind of switch to kind of a larger scale. Uh, so what's interesting about um, the cases that are currently pending before the Supreme Court, and next slide, please. Oh, next slide. So Supreme Court does not take many cases, and particularly rarely it takes actual previous factors, uh, and rather rarely it takes IP cases. So when it happens, these are usually quite impactful uh, decisions. What is even more interesting is in this term, they've taken a couple of cases on IP topics they have not touched in many, many years. Um, the one we're gonna discuss right now, last time was 28 years ago, and the other one was over 50 years ago. So let's look at Andy Warhol case. Uh, actually, previous slide, please. Yeah, there you go. So, the heading is borrowed from NPR uh, podcast about this case. Supreme Court meets Andy Warhol, Prince, and a case that could threaten creativity. Um, 
the oral hearing in this case happened about uh, two months ago, and I will mention some of the commentary about that. But here's here's the case. And I'm sure you recognize Prince, and you may recognize Andy Warhol, and woman standing next to him is Lynn Goldsmith, a prominent photographer of celebrities, a uh, musician herself. She's taken a lot of iconic photographs of rock stars over the years. In 1981, Lynn took a photograph of Prince, at the time a up-and-coming young musician. Um, she did this for a uh, article about him in Newsweek, which actually never and did nothing until 1984, where um, she gave a license to Vanity Fair magazine to use a photograph in their article about Prince. But Vanity Fair did not use the photograph directly. Um, they commissioned Andy Warhol, a famous artist, to create an image of Prince for the article. And in that publication, they gave credit properly to Goldsmith with as, as a offer of the source photograph for the illustration that Warhol produced. And you can see those illustrations um, on the right next to Prince photograph. And you can see how you can, of course, recognize the likeness of Prince in those um, iconic silk screen uh, artwork images by Warhol that he's famous for. So he created a not just one, but 15 images that became uh, kind of a Prince series of artwork. Um, and Andy Warhol Foundation owns the copyright in those images. Uh, it's a nonprofit foundation established after he died, actually later in 1984. And they license these images for various commercial, editorial, and um, museum uh, usage. Fast forward to 2016, where sadly Prince uh, left us. And yeah, there was a lot of news coverage, of course. Uh, Vanity Fair decided to do a tribute edition of, of its magazine um, about Prince. And Lynn Goldsmith learned that Andy Warhol Foundation, AWF, licensed one of the images um, from that set to Vanity Fair. She received no credit as a source image photographer and only Andy Warhol Foundation was attributed. She got upset and notified the foundation of a potential violation of her copyright. So that's kind of the, the background of the lawsuit. Now, let's take a step back for a moment. Uh, we're talking about the IP and social property is covered in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, where Congress has the power to promote progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the right to their respective um, writings and discoveries. And percent to that power, Congress created a Copyright Act of 1976, which grants a variety of exclusive rights to the authors of works of authorship. Uh, next slide, please. Throughout this delay, um, so we've seen we've seen this uh, IP close. And next slide, please. Now, yes. So you you can see the text of section um, one hundred six, where authors, among other things, have exclusive right to reproduce their work, to display publicly, and to prepare derivative works. And so this is something very, very significant. So authors have exclusivity to continue doing kind of follow-up uh, creative work on their original copyrighted uh, art. But uh, in its infinite wisdom, uh, Congress provided a bit of a limitation on that right. Um, and so 
it is okay actually to to for someone else to do that when that use is fair next slide please So section 107 talks about um, exceptions where when a copyright work, copyright work is used for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, um, it's not an infringement. And various factors go into the determination when use of a copyright the image or artwork is fair, such as the purpose and character of the use. So in, in this case, if our whole activity is fair use of the photograph, then the foundation uh, is, is free to license those images without her permission and without paying her. And so now this test, this case essentially tests the boundary at which a new work transforms in an old work to constitute fair use rather than stepping on derivative rights of the copyright uh, owner. And so the decision will have quite a, an impact on copyright law for uh, years to come. Now, this is the second time in the history of Copyright Act when fair use was looked at by uh, Supreme Court in the context of art. Next slide, please. So many, many of you are familiar, of course, with the song Pretty Woman by Roy Arbison and you know, from 1964. In 1989, a rap group, uh, Luther Campbell and his rap group Two Life Crew, wrote a song called Pretty Woman, in which the group intended through comical lyrics to kind of satirize the original work, to criticize, to comment on a sentiment of a simple and perhaps misguided romantic episode with quite raunchy lyric. Uh, they borrowed opening bass riff and first line, but then replaced a, a lot of the arrangement and, of course, the lyrics with their own. Um, and Roy Orbison, um, uh, for, uh, kind of the owners of the copyright in that song, uh, took them to court. And eventually the case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, writing for unanimous Supreme Court, Justice Souter recognized that fair use is essential to a functional copyright law, to critical reflection and to inspiration of new creativity. Um, and so that use, which was essentially a parody, and by the way, it's very unlikely that um, Two Life Crew could have gotten a license from Roy Orbison for that work, right? So the parody is, is fair use. Um, and that kind of created this notion of transformative works where uh, the work that has kind of a different you know, message and meaning with it um, uh, could, be, is, could be fair use. So fast forward to today, the issue is back again in a different context. So in lower court, uh, Goldsmith sought uh, a judgment that that um, there is no, um, I'm sorry, um, Andy Warhol Foundation sued Goldsmith first, seeking judgment that they don't infringe copyright. And if they do, it's fair use. Uh, Goldsmith counterclaimed. The district court actually uh, found for Andy Warhol and agreed that it was fair use and dismissed Goldsmith counterclaim for copyright infringement. And interestingly, the district court concluded that the our Andy Warhol work was transformative because it depicted Prince as a iconic, larger than life figure, while the photograph portrayed him as a uncomfortable, as a vulnerable uh, human being, as he was as a young artist. At the on the on appeal, the Second Circuit disagreed and held that the work was not transformative. Um, based on a perceived meaning of the work, um, 
And actually what's important is whether work adds a fundamentally different and new purpose to the, to the original. And because the photo by Goldsmith remained recognizable in the print, um, it was not considered to be a fair use. So a lot of it was copied and there was no fundamental difference and new artistic purpose. So Supreme Court took this case to intervene and kind of sort out this issue. Next slide, please. And one more. So here's, here's the question, right? Does a work of, of art visually resembles a comparative source material, but conveys a different meaning, fair use? And is court even permitted to consider meaning when evaluating those infringement claims? So this is the question uh, before the Supreme Court. And um, next slide, please. The oral hearing um, took place October 12. It was probably one of the you know, more entertaining um, oral hearings at the Supreme Court in the recent times, where justices asking a lot of kind of hypothetical questions as to at which which kind of transformation or or you know derivative works could be fair use. You know, could movie studios not pay? book authors when a book is taken to, to be made into a movie. Um, and clearly they weren't satisfied with kind of looking for, you know, a new meaning uh, or, or um, message in the transformative work versus um, how much uh, change is really even allowable. So, one thing is clear that they were they weren't satisfied with what the Second Circuit did, and they're they're clearly looking for a new test. On the other hand, um, all the commentators tend to tend to agree that um, the the decision would go uh, to Goldsmith in terms of the um, rights of original authors. And the real question is, what would be the breadth of the upcoming opinion and whether the court will send this case back to lower court to determine whether in, in fact there was fair use or will create a new test for us. And um, we should find out in the next few months, I guess. And of course, in the meantime, if anyone wants to use material that is compared by others to create a new work, even one that might be considered transformational or change, changing its its um, meaning or, or message, um, would be well advised to obtain legal counsel before uh, before doing so. Um, so this is kind of where where things stand. Uh, we're all waiting to see what the Supreme Court do with this pretty significant um, development because the outcome, as you can appreciate could shift the law in to favor more control by the original artist, uh, but by doing so could also inhibit artists and other content creators who built existing work, especially in this day and age, uh, in everything from music and posters and memes to AI creations and documentaries. Um, so something that we are definitely watching um, and, 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 and waiting to see what the um, justices will do. Uh, do I have a couple of minutes, Gabe? Can I can I move to the other, other case? Um, if you can, in uh, a minute, just give the uh, group here a sense of you know what there is around this case, and uh, you're of course always invited back, and the um, slides will be posted. Um, I think uh, a minute is about what we have left. Okay, that's fine. Uh, next slide, please.
So the other case, I'll, I'll just take just one minute. Um, this is relates to enablement with going going to the patent side of things. And as, as many of you know, our patent system has a quid pro quo bargain where inventors receive monopoly on their invention um, and control um, uh, who gets to exploit the invention in exchange for uh, description that should be full and complete enabling uh, as to how to make and use the invention. This part of the law was really not reviewed by the Supreme Court. Cases never came up to, to the review in, in 50 years. I think it was only once um, uh, looked by the Supreme Court in, in the 50s, I believe. And this is um, a case that is specific to biotech inventions, but it also has a potential to disrupt um, the system we have now by requiring essentially how much the inventors need to explain about their inventions. And again, this is kind of a, uh, a bad case to bring up this issue. And in fact, the government, the USPTO, the Solicitor General, um, requested the court not to take the case because it, it really uh, relevant and specific to biotech um, and the dispute between Amgen and Sanofi about the uh, cholesterol lowering drugs. Um, but the decision might have implications in other areas of technology where uh, a heightened requirement to explain more about your invention might lead to some changes in the way um, patent applications are, are prepared. Uh, I'll leave it at that. The case was just taken up at the Supreme Court. Um, there's a, a lot of briefing going on. Many parties submit um, briefs to the court arguing which way this issue should go. Um, it's gonna be very interesting once it comes up um, for the hearing. But like I said, for now, um, we know it has a potential to be quite disruptive um, or it might end up being more narrowly focused on biotech um, inventions and the specific issue in that case. Mark, thank you thank so you. much for presenting uh, <clears throat> these two cases and to give our um, viewers a sense of some of the intellectual property issues that may very well impact them uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. And uh, Mark, we would love to have you back. And I remind the viewers that Mark's full slide deck will be available on our website uh, shortly after this program concludes. And with that, I'll turn to our Next speaker, who is uh, Stephanie Fedorka, uh, who has been with us uh, regularly and is coming to us today from Rochester. And Steph will be uh, discussing actually two uh, labor law matters. And Steph, uh, let me give you the floor so that you can address the group. And thank you so much for coming back. Thanks so much, Gabe. Um, next slide, please, Kathy. Um, just a quick update. I know Gabe had referenced lots of bills being signed. Um, so this one is a particular note to employers in New York State. Uh, last Friday on December 9th, uh, Governor Hochul had signed Senate bill um, into law that amends New York Labor Law 206C, which uh, previously was titled uh, the rights of nursing mothers. It has since been changed as part of these amendments to the right of nursing employees, uh, which I think is relevant um, and, and maybe some indication of a gender neutral term in the law. Um, however, it still does refer to her in within the law itself. But I think that's, you know, of relevance and of note. Um, employers must provide reasonable unpaid break time or permit employees to use paid break time or meal time to allow employees to express breast milk for a nursing child. Um, that is the same. However, there's uh, one change in the law here um, that provides that this time needs to be provided, this reasonable break time needs to be provided to an employee each time the employee has a reasonable need to express breast milk. Um, and this is a right that a nursing employee has for up to three years following the birth of the child. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, most notably, there's some substantial changes with respect to what exactly employers need to provide. 
Previously, employers really needed to provide some room um, or location that was shielded from view, private, um, and in close proximity to the work area and couldn't be a bathroom or a restroom. That's still generally the same, um, but it needs to be well lit. It needs to be free from intrusion from other persons in the workplace or public. And at a minimum, the, these amendments now add that the uh, room and location has to include a chair, a working surface. Uh, nearby access to cleaning water and an electrical outlet provided that the workplace is supplied with electricity. Um, you also, employers have to allow um, access to refrigerators um, for storage of breast milk if an employer provides a refrigerator in the workplace. Next slide, please. I should note that this is largely similar to the New York City provisions um, with respect to a lactation policy or lactation rights. Uh, so it, it, for those of you who have uh, New York City locations, this might not necessarily be a whole lot different from what your policies might already provide. Um, also of note, the amendments add that if the sole purpose or function of that room that is to be used for expressing breast milk is not dedicated to the sole use of um, an employee expressing breast milk, for example, if you don't have a nursing room or an, a, a lactation break room, uh, that that is its sole purpose, the room has to be made available to the nursing employee when needed and cannot be used for any other purpose while it's in use by that nursing employee. Um, employers also have to provide notice to all other employees as soon as practicable when that room has been designated as a place for employees to express breast milk. Next slide, please. Um, there is an undue hardship provision. I would note, though, that this is a high standard, as it usually is for all other um, accommodation laws that you routinely work with. And uh, you, so if an employer is unable to provide those specific provisions within that room, right, the chair, the work surface, um, electrical outlet, close um, proximity to clean running water, et cetera, it's really going to be a high standard to prove and it's gonna ne necessarily require an individualized um, and case-by-case -case analysis depending on what the employer's resources are, the nature or structure of the business, et cetera. Uh, notwithstanding, an employer still has to make reasonable efforts to provide a room, um, even if you can't provide all those other minimums that the law now requires. Um, so work with legal counsel if you're not sure exactly what you have to provide, what you can provide um, to make sure that you're complying with the law and set up for success um, in the event that there's a claim that you weren't complying with the law or making those provisions available to those employees. Next slide, please. Most notably, I think, um, and one of the biggest changes as well, is that the law creates an obligation on the New York State Department of Labor to develop and implement a written policy for employers to use. Um, the written policy is going to include the following requirements. You have to inform employees of their rights under this New York Labor Law Section 206C. It needs to specify the means by which an employee can request a room or location to express breast milk, some sort of process that they can submit a written request um, or verbal request to request such a room uh, to the extent that you don't already have one, uh, you know, that's um, not used for any other purpose. Uh, employer has to respond to that request within a reasonable time frame, but not to exceed five business days. And this written policy is going to have to be provided to employees upon hire annually and upon returning to work following the birth of a child. So that's significantly different than what the previous version of 206C required um, that didn't have those additional written policy type of requirements or those um, annual uh, distribution of the policy. There's also anti-retaliation provisions um, as well for an employee who's exercising their rights under the law. So employers should take the opportunity now. This law goes into effect June 7th of 2023, and we do anticipate that the New York State Department of Labor will develop and implement such a written policy for employers to use. But I think it's a good practice and it, it um, recommend client or uh, employers to review their current um, lactation break policies and start to prepare for compliance and who that individual might be, what that um, process will be or what will look like to submit a written request, um, evaluate what your current uh, physical workplaces look like and what rooms might be designated um, or suitable for those purposes that meet with those, um, have those minimum requirements to provide and minimum accommodations um, and start working on uh, perhaps revising your policy to get ready for compliance. Next slide, please. 
Very, very, very quickly, since we re I spoke about the amendments to New York Labor Law Section 215 a few weeks ago, um, this is a law that just clarifies, again, the anti-retaliation provisions in the New York Labor Law um, and provides that employers cannot retaliate against employees for uh, taking lawful absences. Next slide, please. Um, which includes assessing a demerit, occurrence, or other point or deductions from an allotted bank of time, which either subjects or could subject an employee to disciplinary action, um, which may include or not be, or, but not limited to a failure to receive a promotion or loss of pay. So next slide, please, Kathy. Again, just as a recap, this really calls into question any no-fault um, or points-based attendance policies, particularly those that take any and all absences into account. As I said, this really is intended to clarify. Generally, it has been our recommendation and position to uh, not count those lawful absences into any such policy. But when you're looking at your policies year-end, I know it's handbook time for a lot of you. You might be rolling out updated handbooks or policies um, January 2023, um, opportunity to look at your attendance-based policies and make sure that you are complying and working with legal counsel in case um, you have any questions on the impact of these new amendments. Steph, thank you so much for that uh, thorough coverage and uh, for giving our group a time to uh, really absorb it all. Um, as a reminder, all of your slides will be available uh, to those who um, want to slow down and take a look at them afterward. And uh, with that, let me turn over to Kat Grazios, who will be our final presenter. Um, and Kat is here to tell us about two important cases um, in the higher ed space and uh, to walk us through their implications. Kat, welcome back. Uh, glad to have you from Albany. And the floor is yours. Thanks, Gabe. Um, as Gabe mentioned, I'm here to talk about some higher ed student discipline cases of note. Um, next slide, please. The two cases are a matter of Modziak versus SUNY Maritime and Radwan v. Manuel. Uh, next slide, please. So in matter of Modziak v. SUNY Maritime, a student was alleged to have carved a racial epithet into a dormitory elevator door. Uh, two students made a joint unsworn written statement alleging that they had witnessed the student engage in the misconduct, and the two students did not testify at the hearing but their statement was credited over numerous alibi witnesses and statements presented by the disciplined student. Uh, next slide, please. So the procedural history should be noted. Uh, this was a case that went before the SUNY Maritime College um, board, uh, hearing board. And so the determination of SUNY Maritime affirmed the disciplinary hearing board's decision. This was then appealed up to the appellate division first department. So the appellate uh, court in New York state the New York State Appellate Division First Department overruled the State University of New York's uh, just determination. Um, next slide, please. Um, the First Department ultimately found that the school's denial of the student's administrative appeal was arbitrary and capricious. The court stated that the school failed to consider new evidence sufficient to alter a finding or other relevant facts not brought out at the original hearing because such evidence and or facts were not known to the person appealing at the time of the original hearing. Um, the most important takeaway from this case has to do with the student code of conduct. Um, under the school's code of conduct, there's three limited grounds for an administrative appeal. This includes a request to consider new evidence sufficient to alter a finding or other relevant facts not brought out at the original hearing because such evidence or facts were not known to the person appealing at the time of the original hearing. So you may be wondering, what was this new evidence that should have been you know, brought over in an appeal? Well, after the November 10th, 2021 hearing, the Respondents University Police Department disclosed to petitioner a copy of a September 22nd, 2021 email. So this is about, this is an email that they got a month and a half prior to the hearing. Um, this email was in response to an email sent by the respondent, the school's president to the entire student body saying, you know, we found this racial epithet. If you have any information on it, please email university police. So they got this email within minutes of that email from the president. The email stated that, you know, it was from a student who had moved into the dorms six days prior to the date the student was alleged to have carved that racial writing into the wall. Um, and so he'd seen it, you know, six days prior. So it couldn't have been the alleged student who did it. Um, and this was information that the university police department acknowledged having at the time of the hearing. Um, they acknowledged that they, they acknowledged in their own narratives that they had this information, but didn't disclose it until after the hearing. Um, next slide, please. So respondents failure to turn over the exculpatory evidence in its possession prior to the hearing violated its own policies and procedures. Therefore, this violated the student's due process rights. Um, 
This is an inconsistent following the school's code of conduct. That's what the court found to be the reasoning for why uh, the student should be allowed to appeal. And ultimately, this, the court found that you know, this exculpatory evidence, the extensive alibi evidence, as well as other objective evidence of petitioner innocent under the charges unsupportable as a matter of law, thus warranting vacature of the expulsion penalty, expungement of all references to the underlying charges contained in petitioner's academic record and read statement as a student in good standing. So because they didn't follow their code of conduct, there was a due process right violation and thus the student was found among other evidence to not be responsible for the allegation that of misconduct. Um, next slide, please. So the next case I'd like to talk about is Radwan v. Manuel. Um, this was a case that went up to the, it was a federal case that went up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, so the appellate division of the federal court system. Um, in the lower court, many of the claims were dismissed on summary judgment. Uh, the facts of this case are that a women's soccer, pl soccer player at University of Connecticut or UConn was a recipient of a one-year athletic scholarship, and she raised her middle finger to the television camera during her team's post-game celebration after winning a tournament championship. Um, uh, important to note that the game was nationally televised, and Radwan's gesture was captured on the broadcast. Um, Radwan was punished and suspended from further tournament play, and ultimately also punished by UConn with a mid-year termination of her athletic scholarship. Um, next slide, please. So Radwan brought uh, this lawsuit against UConn and several university officials alleging violation of her First Amendment rights, uh, procedural due process under 42 USC 1983, and Title IX of the Education Amendments, or just known to many as Title IX. Um, the court dismissed the First Amendment in 1983 claims on qualified immunity grounds. Qualified immunity is given to government officials um, unless they violate a federal statutory or constitutional right. And importantly, this element must also be met the unlawfulness of their conduct was clearly established at the time. So in light of the absence of a decision by the Supreme Court or the Second Circuit on the application of vulgar speech by a university student while representing a university at a school-sponsored event, the court held that because there was no precedent, uh, the officials would be entitled to qualified immunity, and thus that aspect of the lawsuit was dismissed. Um, similarly to the procedural due process claims, Radwan claimed that she had a contractual right to uh, her one-year scholarship. The court found that she did have this contractual right, but there was no court precedent in either the Second Circuit or the Supreme Court at the time of this decision uh, affirming as much, and so there was no precedent. Therefore, qualified immunity would be allowed to bar this claim as well. Um, Radwan also asserted a Title IX claim in which she alleged that her scholarship was terminated on the basis of sex. Um, essentially, the lower court found that Radwan had failed to present evidence that male student athletes at UConn similarly situated to her received better treatment when they were faced with misconduct allegations than she had. But Radwan presented evidence of multiple instances, including a football player who kicked a kicked or threw a ball into the sand who was not disciplined as harshly as her. And so the court found that this created enough of an issue that this uh, matter should at least move to trial. And so that claim moves forward and this case is going to move forward to trial now on that one issue. The main takeaway from this case is that um, institutions of higher education should remain cognizant that they're especially concerned about, that, the, that judges are especially concerned about free speech. Um, although that claim was ultimately uh, dismissed because on qualified immunity grounds, there are still several dozen pages worth of discussion, uh, particularly on First Amendment claims in academia. And so that's a really important case to look at with regard to a, a nice procedural background of um, the history of you know, First Amendment claims in academia. Um, additionally, with matters of discipline, schools must ensure that dis the disciplinary process is fair and consistent and performed in a non-discriminatory matter, discriminatory matter, or if not, you know, like we saw this Title IX claim is moving forward because of the allegations of uh, unequal treatment. Um, yeah, that's all for me. Well, Kat, thank you so much for uh, the summary of those two cases. Um, I know all that we're a bit over time and we wanna be respectful of your time, but thank you for staying with us. If you have questions about any of the presentations, our contact information is on the uh, slide that's uh, presently on your screens. I'll be back 
for the very last broadcast of Business in 22 during uh, 2022 on the 27th, uh, we have one more broadcast in between on the 20th. And we really appreciate your continuing uh, efforts to join us on the program. And I hope that all of you stay safe and well out there. And I'm looking forward to being back with you soon.